So welcome to the OpenJS World Fireside Chat on security. Um, today I have with me Jessica and Adam, and I'll give them a few minutes to introduce themselves before we get started. Jessica, why don't you start first? Sure. Thank you. My name is Jessica Wilkerson, and I currently am a cyber policy advisor for the Food and Drug Administration, where I work on cybersecurity policy for securing medical devices. Uh, before that, and particularly relevant to this group, I was the cybersecurity research director at the Linux Foundation. And then uh, prior to that, I spent five and a half years on, with the United States Congress looking at cybersecurity issues in healthcare and energy, telecommunications, uh, pretty much all over the map. So that's me. Thank you. All right. Adam. Hey, everybody. I'm Adam Baldwin. I am a product manager uh, focused on software supply chain security at GitHub. Uh, as you see, I'm sporting my NPM shirt. I came over recently in the NPM acquisition uh, where I uh, used to, at NPM, run uh, security operations. Uh, and as, let's see, prior, I also started the uh, Node Security Project, which many of you may be familiar with uh, as well. And I'm Michael Dawson, IBM's community lead for Node.js. What that means is I get to spend a lot of time involved in the Node.js and OpenJS uh, Foundation. Uh, participating in a, in a whole bunch of the different working groups, including ones which have, have touched on security and so forth. Uh, so, so Jessica, one of the things that really interested you me uh, interested me about the things you, you said you're working on is your work at the FDA. And I kind of wonder how, you know, JavaScript being used in critical infrastructure, if you're already seeing that happen, like medical devices, cars, and so forth, changes how, you know, we need to build, maintain, or, or sort of think about security for JavaScript. Sure, it's definitely, it's a, it's a huge consideration for the Food and Drug Administration in particular and for when I was at the United States Congress and we oversaw other federal agencies who have stakeholders in, uh, in critical infrastructure, like you said, cars and others. Um, you know, I, I, certainly everybody on this panel and everybody I think who's going to be in the audience knows that most software today is primarily open source. You have open source software and everything, you're never going to have a piece of software, nor really should you that isn't built with open source. And so open source security is critical infrastructure cybersecurity. That's just the way that it is today. And so for us, uh, we are working currently with our stakeholders and within the agency itself to figure out how to tell what a given product is built out of. So software bill materials is something that some folks may be familiar with. That is a, a policy that we're very much pursuing where we are looking to have folks who are developing medical devices submit to us a list of all the software that's contained within it. And while we don't necessarily have those in all cases yet, what we are expecting in the future as we get more and more software building materials, we're going to see more open source software, we're going to see more JavaScript. And in that case, it's clearly going to have medical device impacts and it's going to drive continued interest from us at the Food and Drug Administration in that security. Yeah, and I can, I can see that being really interesting in terms of, you know, some of the things we're working on in the community in terms of, say, like the package maintenance working group, where, you know, some uh, packages, you know, are looking for more support or are struggling to keep things going. If that software is being used in some of that critical infrastructure, it's even more important to, to figure out how we get the businesses which are using them uh, involved in participating to collaborate with the, the maintainers, support them financially, or, or through some other mechanism. Yeah, I definitely love to see more support coming out of organizations that rely on open source. Um, I, I have often said you're, you're responsible for what you require, right? What you depend on. And that risk is transferred to that organization. And a lot of times we, we hear, oh, well, you know, uh, we're just consuming it. We're not, we're not basically, if you're not supporting it, then you're, you're sort of like pushing that responsibility onto others. And, um, which is, which is unfortunate. I mean, and I, and I yeah, guess and I there's, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, you know, we're at the food and drug administration, I think in other parts of the government, we're much more used to dealing with physical supply chains. You know, we've, we've known how to do that for a long time. If you are the final goods manufacturer, I actually, I think the term is final goods assembler for a car or something, you are responsible for anything that you put into your final good. Um, and I think we don't necessarily have that same mentality in software and nor necessarily should we, but I think lessons learned and 
best practices that we can look at from the physical manufacturing space and certainly transfer over to software. I think if we don't have to relearn all of those very hard lessons, we, we shouldn't. Yeah, definitely like in the package maintenance working group, we're working on some tooling. Um, and I think that'll be, you know, important things like the the NPM audit seems to have helped a lot in terms of raising the visibility of, of vulnerabilities. The tooling we're looking at is to help you under, better understand um, the uh, packages that you do depend on, what level of support they provide, what kind of backing there is behind um, um, the, you know, the project, is it a, you know, one person building it themselves as a hobby or is it actually backed by a, a commercial company? I just wonder, you know, if there's any analogs or um, experience we can, we can pull from those other areas that you mentioned in terms of tooling that's necessary to, to do that, uh, meet those kinds of requirements. Yeah, I think there, there probably are. Um, the tooling, I think, is an interesting question. That's something that's being developed in parts of the sector right now for um, many folks who are involved in ongoing efforts, multi-stakeholder efforts around software building materials. That effort is passed to a certain extent. One, the, the idea of whether or not it's a good thing. I think every, the answer is yes, it's a good thing and everybody needs to be doing it. Um, and two, even necessarily what it looks like there's certainly been frameworks proposed for if you were going to do software bill of materials here are the base elements it needs to have uh, and now i think the the next really large hurdle that everyone is trying to figure out how to surmount is um how do you possibly do that much asset and inventory tracking when you have versioning concerns and all these other things and so the, the tooling is going to be very important and i think in some circumstances it is unique in, in ways that physical manufacturing and physical goods tracking isn't, but certainly there are enough analogs and parallels that you know there are, there are certainly things that we can carry from one to the next. Yeah, it seems like there'd be a lot of like a lot of things that we can adapt, kind of pull and adapt. There's you know there's automation for food processing, right, to to identify a, a bad mm -hmm. piece of fruit and to automatically you know remove it from from going net further down the line, or and a lot of that is process driven, right? So so luckily oh. in the digital space we can. We can implement those things in, in a lot of automated ways. That's cool. One thing this this conversation has me thinking One about thing is that like I think is going to be important. And yeah. I no, no, go ahead. Sorry. There's a little bit of a lag. I think yeah. in, yeah, I in think so. our uh, our talk here. It might be my internet. Apologies, everyone. Um, but I think one thing that I do that we want to be careful on, and this was something that we explored when I was still at the uh, United States Congress Energy and Commerce Committee, and it's something that we certainly take into consideration now. Um, open source software developers, in some cases they're commercial, they're getting, they're getting paid to do this uh, as part of their jobs, and others, they're, they're not. Um, you know, where in, in many phys physical manufacturing or physical supply chain issues, you, you're doing business to business, and these are sophisticated organizations negotiating with each other. Um, I think one thing that we do want to be cognizant of and careful of is we continue to see I, at least as we continue to reveal more open source usage within critical infrastructure, uh, is to be careful about what we can realistically expect uh, those developers and those package maintainers and others to be providing, uh, you know, depending on what level of support they're getting in, in their daily lives to, to do this kind of development. I think, you know, there has to be a proportionality and a balance there so that we're not overloading, um, overloading that system. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, one thing I, you know, the conversation has has made me think a little bit about, like, is there something that, um, you know, the project or the OpenJS Foundation should be trying to do to bring people together to talk about this particular topic, so that the JavaScript community is is ready to continue to participate in in those areas, in terms of the software being used, or, or is it that you know the the larger problems will be figured out in general and just apply to to JavaScript as well? I mean, we're the we're the kind of the the leading edge, right? In terms of a lot of the, we, we've we've uh, we tried to establish a, a bill of materials as as a core piece of like a, a, a node a node project, right? We've got a, a package JSON. Uh, it doesn't solve all the problems, right? You can still vendor uh, vendor things. Um, but uh, you know, I, I kind of look uh, to what JavaScript has done as as definitely a leading edge in terms of like um, we uh, and it, get my words mixed up here. But uh, 
Yeah, I mean, like what we're doing is is going to influence, I think, a lot of the other ecosystems given given the popularity of JavaScript. Okay, so we're kind of we're kind of hopefully uh, uh, already doing what we need to be doing, and just uh, need to continue pushing forward on that. I, I want to maybe move move to another topic based on what Jessica just said in terms of expectations. One of the things I, I've kind of seen recently flare up a couple times is there seems to be some tension between uh, maintainers and vulnerability reporters, and you know some discussion around you know reporters uh, reporters will get paid through bug bounties or through some other way. Meanwhile, that can cause a lot of work to maintainers who who aren't necessarily getting paid. And that the, the existing tools don't necessarily help out, and that you know if they revolt, if they report a vulnerability, it may not even apply to a to a particular package or project, but they still end up having to go through a fire drill to to address that. Um, so I, I wonder what your take was was on that discussion. Well, you can kind of blame for the the npm audit uh, <laughs> uh, if you, if you want to, you can you can tweet me at Adam underscore Baldwin. Um, but yeah, I mean, we started that pattern a long time ago with with NSP, right? Like, sort of being able to like, okay, this is this package has a known vulnerability, surface that, um, and it's it's while it's brought attention that the we wanted to raise awareness of that. It's definitely caused you know some some heartache, uh, some chore, uh, some frustration, um, because it doesn't. It, it's we're using the same tech, we're doing the same thing that 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 you know, I started doing it years ago, right? Like it's, it hasn't really adapted. It hasn't, uh, we haven't got context around the exploitability of those vulnerabilities. Are you actually calling the method that, uh, that is referenced for, for a piece of vulnerable code? And of course that brings then uh, pain to the, the maintainers, right? Like that brings somebody that says, well, like this is a bug. Um, and uh, you know, the maintainer might not think it is, but the security researcher thinks it is. And, and there is definitely a, um, you know, uh, attention there. But what we have to realize is that um, on the on the researcher side, they're they're trying to help. They're they're they genuinely in 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 most cases trying to help. They're trying to surface a, a problem that they see, and they're trying to help. Um, and I, I I think that we haven't done you know what what we need is to facilitate better communication between those uh, between those worlds. Um, you know, right now we say like, well, they're getting paid for, for to find bounties, right? And I'm not getting paid. Like there's nobody sponsoring my page to fix, um, you know, to, to fix these things. Um, they're doing, uh, you know, in a, in a lot of cases, the bugs that we're talking about, the ones that, that are just kind of, you know, what I consider kind of these garbage bugs that are, that are, I don't know, not really interesting. They're not getting paid for those. They're, they're, they're not getting, they're not getting paid out for those. Um, and they're doing the equivalent of what the open source contributor uh, was doing earlier their career, right? They're creating so open source, maybe to create an opportunity for themselves to create something for the world. Um, security researchers doing the same. They're following that curiosity They're They are also trying to make a name for themselves by uh, finding these things and, and ultimately trying to trying to help the ecosystem the way they know how we as developers and as that ecosystem have not invited them in fully. We still keep them kind of at arm's length, re, you know, report things here. Um, and even though that tooling is not, not that great. Um, we even have like, we have NPM, we have GitHub, we have the, the foundation, we have a, a multitude of places uh, for these researchers to go report things to um, that are all over the place. So it's like, that's not even consistent. So it could, there's there's communication, uh, a communication problem here, really. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. Like there's, you know, even discussion in the, the community right now in the security working group about the, 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 the vulnerability database and reporting and like, you know, as you said, things have changed over the, the last eight years. And so it's a good time to kind of figure out, well, should we have these different vulnerability databases? Can we consolidate? Can we, can we make it easier to report? And I think your point about bringing people into the projects more closely is important. Like, I think, you know, a lot of the time there's friction that's because you, ha you have sort of what feel like two sides. If we can bring the, the, the researchers and the project closer together, Hopefully we can get more of the, you know, the us and I think things go a, a lot more smoothly like that. So, you know, maybe that's something that we need to try and Jessica. get some focus on. Sorry. Yeah, Jessica. I was actually going to say it's it's interesting because I think, you know, in, in government, we're, we're usually a couple of steps behind uh, everybody else. But I, I think in this, it's interesting because we actually have developed um, 
at FDA over the last couple of years, a very robust coordinated disclosure program. So not necessarily that um, finders of bugs and medical products are reporting them directly to us, though they can put them going directly to the manufacturers. But in a lot of cases, we found in the more recent uh, issues that we've had, we're able to essentially put us, the manufacturer who has the issue and the person who found the issue on a single call or not right now during COVID, but in the past in a, in a single room together <laughs> right. uh, and everybody just kind of sits down and talks about it. And I think the, the part that's made that very valuable for us is in this time element of, you know, you're all saying sometimes it's very difficult for these maintainers. They have to go in these fire drills. Um, and what the model that we've sort of adopted here where appropriate of, of having everybody on the same call or in the same room, the manufacturer can just ask the researcher about the technical details and the researcher can provide the feedback and it becomes this, this loop so that the, the, those little pieces can be identified and, and the, okay, this isn't part of this vulnerability and we don't need to worry about that, set that aside. And it's not something that the, the manufacturer in our case is tracking down in a vacuum. And, and we found that to increase the speed with which vulnerabilities can be fixed. Yeah, that almost, that almost makes me wonder, like today it's kind of the model where you report the vulnerability, but it doesn't necessarily come along with a fix. I think it would be a lot more valuable if we could mm -hmm. somehow get to the point where it's like either, you know, the, the fix is jointly developed or along with the vulnerability, it's like, and here's a way we can fix it. Um, part of that's maybe making the, mm -hmm. the researchers more comfortable, you know, working in the projects or, or, or working in the projects as part of the, the, the work that they do to find problems, but then positioning them so they could fix them as well. Yeah, that's the, that's an interesting thing. I've been on both sides of that. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm a security practitioner, I can write code, but I don't write very good code. Um, and so, um, you probably don't want what I consider to be a fix. Um, to be contributed to your project, right? Like, um, but I can certainly find and, and point that flaw out. Um, I would absolutely love to see more security practitioners coding um, and to be contributing code. Um, I think that sh if they were, they would feel more empathy for the other party on the other side of, of what's happening here. Um, I don't, again, I think that sometimes, um, I, I really think it needs to be a collaborative effort. I, I, I would love to, you know, obviously getting a pull request that says, Hey, here's a problem and here's a fix. Like that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. But, but um, you know, you, you run into projects that are like, uh, well, we don't have any test coverage. So you have no idea what you're breaking, right? There, there's a lot of like basic hygiene things that could be done, um, you know, across the board. And you're talking about moving thousands and thousands and thousands of developers um, in the right direction so that, that, you know, these things can improve. Um, yeah. But certainly a checklist like that that says what makes it what makes you ready to accept uh, vulnerabilities and, and potentially fix this along with it because you're right like without test coverage it's a much scarier thing to propose or even accept a, a change like that. Yeah, so, so the starting point for most developers is going to be to create like a security MD um, file in your repository, right? Basically creating your as a as a maintainer as a project. Here's how we want to accept your feedback, right? Here's how we want to step, accept your report. Um, that is the one sort of like method that, uh, that we have to sort of communicate that is put that in your project and say, you know, email me here. Um, you know, because of wonderful things like GDPR and, and all those things, like we don't necessarily make all that, that data, like how to contact you public. Um, and I'm hopeful, I'm new to GitHub, but I'm hopeful that we can get some of those private channels to maintainers for reports. Um, so they don't show up in public issues. Uh, and things like that, but but basically asserting like this is this is what you can expect uh, from me as a maintainer. Um, but we also have to hold that with a grain of salt, right? These again are typically volunteer projects, right? These are people with small amounts of time and. Right. Okay. So actually, you know, time flies. Uh, we're almost out of time. So I just want to give you each, uh, you know, thirty seconds to to you know make your call to action. What would you like people to be thinking about or doing to help move? Uh, us forward on the, the security front for JavaScript. Uh, Jessica, you want to start? Sure. I think what I would say, um, and this is not meant to be a, a frightening thing at all, just an, just an awareness thing, is understanding that while open source software is not typically associated with cr critical infrastructure, it's not typically thought of as something that could have physical 
harm, potentially harmful impacts to patients or to, to cars or the grid or whatever it is, is acknowledging that rightly or wrongly it's ended up there. there there's open source software in implanted medical devices and others and uh, just thinking about that as development is occurring and, and decisions are being made about the security and other uh, characteristics of the software. Thanks. Adam? Um, I think, you know, in, 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 this, in, this, in the same vein, right, like that, 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 that open source has showed up uh, in those super important places, uh, we as maintainers have to um, do good hygiene to, to, you know, to take care of our accounts because our accounts are the thing that give access to publishing as us or, you know, adding, you know, a backdoor or, or something malicious. So I would really, really love to see adoption of, of 2FA. Uh, getting getting more maintainers to enable 2FA. If if just a handful of you listening go enable 2FA, you'll have made my day. So, thanks. Okay, and I'll I'll just close out with you know we've mentioned a few times that collaboration would help in a lot of areas, and so my my call to action would really be to come and get involved in the in the JavaScript community. We've got a proposal for collaboration spaces out there. You know we could make security one of those. I think if we can get more people involved to figure out what the best practices would be, what that basic, basic maintenance would be, it's going to be a lot easier than each maintainer having to figure it out themselves and then security reporters having to deal with different approaches and so forth. So that's my call is, is for everybody to, you know, hopefully come out and, and, and help be part of the solution by getting involved there. Um, so that's the time we thank we have. Thanks for everybody who's, who's been watching the panel and, um, you know, we look forward to, uh, you know, maybe meeting you in the OpenJS Foundation work going forward. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Thank you.